for those who doesn't know, Bartos um, Borutsky is the, is the CEO of the company called Smarter Diagnostic uh, Diagnostics, which is uh, related to medical imaging and understood for joints like knees or elbows or uh, things. And you are also, you may you want to say more like what were your uh, past experience with the university reports? So. Yeah, maybe maybe let, let me just briefly make this background so, so everyone is, is aware because it, it might guide your questions later on. Uh, yeah, so I've been working with the University of Warsaw for uh, more than 15 years. Um, I've been uh, always with uh, the institute that is called ICM. I, I do believe you are aware of that not only from the numerical weather forecast that ICM is, is, is creating, but as it's quite similar to Cifronet that, that you're collaborating with. Uh, it's, it's a supercomputing center at the University of Warsaw, also doing a lot of applied applied science across applied mathematics and, and uh, information technologies. And uh, for a number of years, I've been responsible uh, to position similar to what what Alex is doing, so so being a, a leader of a, of a research group uh, related to data visualization and image processing and computer vision. But uh, our main focus was always around uh, medical imaging, uh, and uh, for for a number of years we have have been performing multiple external or internal projects on, on some applied challenges across across um, visualization and medical imaging. Uh, so um, this was always the background and orthopedics was, was actually one, one of also our most common uh, application areas. So, so that, that's probably how, um, how, how the, this background resulted in what, what I'm doing right now. Uh, and uh, at the specific time, uh, we have made a decision to, to, to start uh, running a spin-off company to take the, the problem into our own hands. And this is how Smarter Diagnostics was, was started, uh, being a spin-off company of the University of Warsaw. And and uh, starting with, with a commercialization of uh, some results of, of the project, of the R&D project that we've been uh, performing for, for a few years earlier. But more, maybe if we want to dig more like into the like personal thing, why, why you decided, oh, let's create this company with what we know, why? Yeah, so <laughs> this is probably the most important questions that you you guys want to hear. Uh, the, the problem, well, actually there are two, two pieces of this answer, I, I think. The, the first one is that for, for the experience of being at the university and, and performing a number of, of um, applied sciences projects, uh, significantly some externally funded like NCBR or, or things like that, uh, that were very close to implementation, very close to deployment uh, in, practic in practice. Uh, almost every time the project uh, finished, uh, the results were actually just put into the drawer and nothing happened later. And, and th this was, uh, very bad for our mindset, I must say. Uh, and we had one approach uh, earlier with, with taking the process of the commercialization of the results into our own hands, not letting it to the university, but taking it into our own hands. Uh, it was actually a cardiological pr project related to um, some um, fluid dynamics in, in coronary arteries. Um, but at that time, we had not made a decision to, to, to make this step towards uh, running our own company. We wanted to stay at the university uh, and uh, just uh, sell it, sell the, the results to some external company. And there was such a huge number of formal problems on the way, uh, including the, I would say, you know, the, the very powerful position of the institution like the university. Um, trying to be a lion, but at the same time meeting some small companies that just want to do something. And, and it was just impossible to meet 
so the next time then the next project we have completed which was in in orthopedics it was much closer to our to our hearts uh we have decided that okay this is this is over we don't want to finish another project uh, ending up in a drawer uh, we don't want to go again through this whole uh, problems uh, trying to commercialize it by selling so we've made a decision okay this time let's try it by ourselves we have decided that we will leave the university for for some time uh, and and try to uh, start a startup and then to and and run it and this is this is actually the, the main reason for 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 the decision so so th this this first one and the second one um, I think was uh, more substantial or related to the topic. So um, in, in the previous projects, uh, we, we didn't have actually our own feeling or our own heart to, to, to follow with this topic and to continue. Uh, we, we, we didn't believe in, in, in the product as much as in this case. So when this, this two, these two reasons met in, in a specific time, time point, so on, on one hand side, believing that we need to take it into our own hands to, to com continue, and on the other hand, that this is something that we believe in and we do want to continue it, not only on the research level, but also on an on, on implementation level, uh, th that's how the decision was made. But uh we were totally green as entrepreneurs so uh, this is a very difficult decision because you, you need to change the role from being the scientist and a group leader and and a project manager into into becoming an entrepreneur and and this is not easy so in according at least to your experience or your case was uh, kind of anyway more uh more straightforward to completely change the role rather than doing a commercialization through the uh, university for. Yeah, but uh, still, if you have developed something through, OK, maybe this is uh, we should I should stop recording. <laughs> <laughs> maybe if you uh, but if you have developed something within the university, then there will be not that easy that you move the intellectual property outside with you. So they kind of still. Uh, yeah, so I don't think you need to stop recording. This is actually the the, the most common question I, I meet quite often while, you know, uh, supporting some early stage companies at incubation level or, or something like that is is how you can collaborate with the university and how do you cope with the IP actually? Because the question that I hear very often is whether I can leave the university and having some concepts in my head that were created during during my, my work at the university or at a scientific institution. It doesn't have to be university. Uh, can I start my own company with these ideas and with these concepts? Uh, or do I need to become a spin-off company or, or, or spin-out company and, and collaborate with, with the university? And these are, I, I, I think, very case-specific answers. Uh, but... Uh, on one hand side, you need to remember that things that are in your head and are not anyhow uh, protected, uh, they are not owned by the by, by, by your institution. Yeah? This is your experience, your life experience, your knowledge that you have in your head, and you can do whatever you want with it. But of course, if this is uh, some kind of intellectual property that was created, or some algorithm that is kept secret and and uh, it was not published, uh, it, it's the IP of the of, of of the institution, and you cannot use it. Uh, you cannot use it outside. So I do believe this is case specific, uh, but again, there, there is this second level of, of the, of, of the um, decision is how you want to uh, move this IP out of the institution into your company that you are starting, whether you are a spin out and, and your uh, relation with the, with the scientific institution is only on commercial levels. So you pro probably license or just buy out the IP out of the, out of the um, institution, or uh, are you a, a spin-off company? And there comes a lot of questions how this institution can bring the IP into the company. Uh, this is a very, very difficult in Poland. I haven't seen much of very, uh, many of, of, of very 
good solutions to that. The majority is is somehow divided between the licensing model and and some um, shareholding by by the by the scientific institution. But I'm a huge fan of. Um, Finding a way that a contribution of the institution into the company is the IP and to make everybody happy and secure, also the investors, um, is that the IP is inside the company, but the university has some safety measures that it can take it back if the company fails. Uh, and and, and this, is, this is quite a fair scenario. Uh, but yeah, coming to, to, to your very question, um, this is difficult and, and, and this is really the hardest decision that you can make on, on, the, on the very, very beginning. And I have seen uh, startups uh, going both ways. So we are actually one of the not, not so many examples of startups that have um, decided to stay with the university. The university is still our shareholder. We have a mixed uh, solution for having the licensed IP and the opportunity to buy out this IP whenever we want. Uh, so it, it's it's again quite quite comfortable for us. Okay, and going back to your personal story, like the when you started this company, the other co-founders were already. Did you already know them? Was someone already in your network, or you need to find somebody and? How you find it if you need somebody from the external world? Yeah, in in our case, both co-founders, myself and Norbert, uh, we are both from 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 the same team at the university. So we had the same the same background, and uh, we have become become the, the co-founders. We were not looking for for someone else. Uh, so so we did we didn't have uh, that problem uh, back then when we were starting. But uh, looking back. Um, it might have been a mistake. Uh, why? Because, um, okay, we are different because we, we have a long-term experience working together. And, and in our case, we know that we knew that, that the difference between us is that Norbert, and he's actually right now a CTO, he's more, more devoted to the technology itself. itself and I, am, I was always more devoted to uh to management uh, so so this is how how we divided our roles in the company so so i'm ceo he's cto uh, but right now we are aware that we were missing the competencies uh, someone who has some business backgrounds who has some financial background and if i uh, if i were to, to to start this process again i would find a third founder uh, for two reasons. First of all, to, to complement those, those, those capabilities back then, uh, so some, some business and financial uh, knowledge. And second, I do believe that number three is much better than number two, uh, because in, in any kind of decision-making situations, it's, it's always easier to, to, to make a decision when there is three of you. Uh, and it's also, I think, it's much much healthier for all the challenging discussions that you have across the C-level team, across the founders team, uh, because uh, because the, there is some always, even if you two agree on something, there is always someone third to, to, that, that can challenge that. Uh, and so, yeah, so I would change that, but, but uh, I don't know the answer for the question, what is the best scenario to, to look for additional founder? Where do you find him? But the fit is something that is very important. If you don't have a uh, team fit and, and good understanding on, on the founder's level, then you are multiplying the risks, actually, which is, again, not that good for your company at the, at the long term. Uh, I, I know that there are many ways to find uh, co-founders, but so far, most of the people I discussed, uh, because I asked this question to 100 people, they were always saying, uh, within my networks. Yeah. So I, I hardly, I know that there are platforms for finding co-founders or uh, you go to a conference and you start looking or you approach someone, but 99% I, I heard this uh, answer that there were someone I already know 
from, yeah. from then the, the, there is a trust issue you know so so if you want someone uh, actually every person that you want to have on the cup table of your company and to be a shareholder uh, you need to be aware of uh, how where is the trust level for, for, for that person or institution so yeah, this is this is important and this is also a very important question if you want to have the um, publicly founded institution on your cap table. Of course, the university is not present on the cap table by itself. It has a it has a company that is that is um, that the university owns, uh, and and the company is a shareholder uh, for all the all the startups, uh, all the spin-off companies that, that the university is producing. This this is a formal, of course, uh, solution. Uh, but 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 again, mm, you need to be aware, and we have unfortunately uh, had some issues with that in past uh, that. Um, the institution like the university or some institute, uh, which is a public company, has a very, very slow uh, decision making process and, and uh, a lot of burden on some formal, uh, formal procedures. So, um, so that they cannot act as fast as the startup would expect. So, 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 so this is an important yeah, uh, variable. <laughs> this, this is an important variable. We know something about it. Uh, and instead, uh, okay, let's assume, okay, yeah, mm, you have uh, some co-founders, you created your startups and uh, temporarily you left the limbo of the university and now uh, you developed something and you, I don't know what was the, was a product, was a licensing, was a meta, but anyway, we were the first customers, uh, how do you find them? Well, that, that's a tough question because, again, I do believe that that's very case specific. Um, and uh, I, I, I see it totally different in medtech and, and totally different in, in other application areas because the, the huge difference is, is the regulatory landscape that you need to follow and the long time to market that you need to wait until you can commercially and clinically apply uh, your medical your medical solution. Um, Depends so, what you do, like. yeah, yeah, of course, of course. But Depends but uh, in in our case, when we are in the pipeline of of in the whole process of of certifi certifying a medical device, then the, the largest question is not how do you find the uh, the, the paying customers, um, but how do you find early adopters that are willing to collaborate with you on some commercial or future commercial basis uh, before you before you you have all the regulatory process completed um, and and this this is a challenge but okay it, it's a very case specific again uh, but uh, the straight answer to your question I, I, I do believe is, is again the network because uh, in our case the majority of our early adopters are, institutions that were already present in our network uh, on very early stages. Um, so, uh, for example, some some private or public hospitals in orthopedics uh, or some diagnostic uh, companies um, or some connections that we have built during some early acceleration phases and, and uh, during customer development process and, and trying to uh, perform market segmentation. So, so all, the, all the connections that we have made uh, on these stages are now our early adopters. Uh, well, not all of them, but, but the, other, the other way around. So all, all of the early adopters were in our network present earlier. Even people you involved uh, for initial feedback. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah. Uh, what do you think of this? They give you feedback and then, OK, now the product actually looked like something they even wanted. So now, mm -hmm. you, ah, now we have it. Do you want to buy a license or whatever? <laughs> We are not there yet, <laughs> but uh, yeah, th th this is uh, this is again a big question whether having achieved what they were addressing to you, uh, are they uh, do they have the willingness to pay for that? 
but but if you I do believe that if if you do the whole process properly and you really answer to, to the to the needs that they have and and uh, bring them something that solves the problem that they have that they will pay it for it. Of course, if if you find a model for for payment source, which in medical settings is again something different than in other uh, other segments because you need to uh, decide whether you're heading for some reimbursement or not. Uh, so, so again, this, this is slightly different. Whether you are targeting a public sector or private sector, whether you are reaching to a patient um, pockets or, or, or looking uh, founding at some healthcare payers. So, so the, the model differs, and and uh, I think you need to show a little different value depending on where do you want to find the money for that. And also. Uh... In this long process, like in the meantime, assuming you need also investors, uh, because generally one of the first questions uh, on whatever, even about angels and venture capital, they will ask like, how, uh, of course, the, the people going off the book will tell you, ah, what's the patent? But uh, other people maybe will ask you generally, how do you protect yourself? What's your special things so that nobody can copy it uh, in the meanwhile mm -hmm. and like what was your experience or uh, even interaction of what uh, what i don't know if you have a vc money or not or yeah what they were were they asking you something like this were they convinced do you need to have a patent do you show them ah we are trying to have an fda so we will protect it in the sense that we have an fda and the others don't have it or something else like how will you protect? Uh... Yeah, so um, talking about the patents and algorithms and software is always a difficult topic in Poland significantly. In Europe, it's still in not Europe. that uh, in Europe, it's still not that obvious. In the US, it's, it's a little bit uh, more straightforward. Uh, but uh, I always uh, say, this is my belief, I don't know if, if, if it's good or not, that if you're trying to, if, if you are in medical imaging segment, uh, then patenting, it's not the way for you to go because of the financial burden that it brings, because it, it, is, it is expensive. To go through the whole uh, through the whole uh, patenting process, especially that on the other hand you want to publish something uh, to bring some clinical evidence and to show that your algorithm or, or solution is working. Um, so um, I don't believe in patenting uh, image processing technologies, um, and I do believe that. Making it secure as your company secret and uh, protecting pro just protecting the, the codes and, and the IP uh, means just a faster way to market. And being a startup, the faster you go to market, the, the faster you validate the technology, especially when you're the first one, um, is, is better. And uh, when you already have the money flowing, then you can think on, on, on some patents later on. Uh, if this is still an option. On the other hand side, you, you see a lot of uh, patent trolling and, and some uh, trials of uh, very widely defined patents across significantly coming from the manufacturers of medical imaging equipment, uh, trying to, I don't know, I have seen Siemens trying to patent uh, just doing a CT scan and applying an algorithm to image processing. So <laughs> at this level of generalization. Uh, so of course they, they, they were unsuccessful, but, but they are trying. Uh, so if you want to kick with the horse, this is not a way to go for a startup. You, you, you just don't have the power to do that. So for a startup, I think it's better to show the Mm, the value proposition and validate it as soon as you can and just get to the moment where some larger company can buy you out and worry for the patenting and, and IP protection by, by themselves. It's, it's, I, if you are in biotechnology, then it's, it's a slightly different, different discussion. As 
significantly if you leave the technology inside the scientific institution and the university, for example, can follow the patenting uh, procedure and just just leave you with the license and the, the, the securities on the on the on the institutional level. So that, that that's my thought. What we are doing in our case, uh, we have two solutions to, to protect this. So the, the one is, is as, I, as, I, as I said, it's just a company secret and we are just protecting our, our algorithms and source codes and, and so on, which is again, kind of a challenging thing when you, when you are deploying uh, Python, Python codes. Uh, so so it's, it's quite difficult to protect the, the, the reverse engineering when you want to de deploy it outside of your cloud solution. But th this is a different story. Uh, and the second thing that I believe in and, and we are doing is that if we are talking uh, AI uh, and, and actually the, your training set is something that makes your solutions unique, uh, this is also kind of a solution to protect uh, protect yourself. So we are very heavily protecting our data set uh, because it, it's quite unique. And it, it's unique because of two, two sources that, that we have it from. One source was, was uh, a scientific project that it, it was just very non-standard data set that is not performed on a daily basis across clinics. So this is unique for our solution. And secondly, all of the pilots that we have founded uh, so far uh, and all the data that we are gathering across the pilots are, are also not clinical standard. Uh, so it's it's not that easy for anyone else to uh, gather a similar data set to create a similar solution. Uh, yeah, yeah. Was so it, it's it's kind of costly to 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 do to do it again. So that's what I was thinking. That might be a, a way of protecting. Either you have a unique uh, data set collect in time, or with many other partners or whatever competitors will taking a while to reproduce. Or maybe the fact that you have already a networks of customer, not customer, you have already these networks of uh, early adopters. So then maybe, maybe an investor will believe this is a, a kind of a way of protecting. Since you have already your own, it's not that straightforward like in uh, in Facebook. You know, Facebook is just a website. Uh, the value of Facebook is that there are users in it. The users, right. Uh, I was thinking that no, but something similar in MedTech that you have value because you have already a group of people independently yeah, from but the you, training data set. But yeah, but you need to remember that at the end of the day, and this is very crucial for the investors that, that will address the problems uh, you have you have in your startup, that at the end of the day, you, you need to make valuation of your company based on something so all the investors are here because they want to exit uh, and 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 earn a lot of money on the on the exit so uh, you either build the valuation of your company on revenue which is of course good but on the other hand side you you have two other pillars that that you can contribute well okay it depends on the on the business model again as you said facebook they have the, the pillar on the users uh, I will not have the pillar on the users, but okay, if I am doing a SaaS solution um, and I will have the customers, the customer's base is something building uh, um, evaluation. But but this is again, from the investor's point of view, more seen as uh, monthly recurring revenue and, and, and something like that. But two other pillars that you have, especially if you are a deep tech company, um, you have the pillar of, of data set. So the, the biggest, uh, the, the, the larger, the, the, the in-house data set you have, uh, the, the, the bigger your valuation is. Uh, we have seen a number of really huge numbers on the market uh, when IBM Watson was buying out the, the companies out of the market just for the purpose of the data sets that they had. Uh, and the, they have, I, I, I think I remember that they have put something like five or seven billion dollars into, into just buying the data sets out of the market. Um, and the third pillar um, is, is your IP. So, so, so some kind of technology that, that you have. And this is something that 
the investors were addressing with us on every stage. So monthly recurring revenue is too early for us still, but they want to know what is our plan to build up the in-house data set because this this also builds up a value of the company and what is our plan to keeping the ip inside the company so they wanted to know what is our plan and do we have a formal security for that that the ip from the university can be put into the company not being licensed but can be bought out uh, out of the out of the university uh, and uh, that all the um, employ employees and uh, founders and so on uh, in every agreement that the IP IP security is is, is also on a high level that the company actually owns all the IP that it's it's creating. So so yeah, I, I think these are the, the, the these three pillars. And going back to your saying, so investors are interested, of course, in money and exit. And, but when I was asking what the other founders are interested in the long term, I I heard mostly three three, three paths. Uh, one is uh, that you keep growing, growing in uh, with the circles of uh, investment, and in the end you have the IPO, or people saying, uh, ah no, we reached a certain point and we got acquired, so we. We have our own little space within something bigger, and that might be good or bad for a series of things. And, and or other people that were telling me, ah, maybe we we have our first round of investment. We are having some sales. Maybe we slow grow with this. We don't need to get to the IPO. We can stay little forever, and we are happy. Where would you see in this tree? What will you do? IPO, acquisition, or small, uh, slow growth? I, I think this is also coming back a little bit to your first question on 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 the on the on the question: Why do you start uh, a company? Why why do you start a startup? Uh, because, and this is again a question that I have heard multiple times. Uh, I still hear it all the time. Uh, what, what, what's your plan? Whether you want to stay with the company for a longer period, or do you want to sell it as soon as possible? Or what's your plan as a CEO, as a as a, as a co-founder? And um, when I was making this decision, I or maybe before I had the decision, I had the, this 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 approach that I am building something very important for me. I am putting myself into the company uh, as a founder, as as a, uh, yeah, and and. That I want to stay with it as long as possible, make it grow. It's my child, and and I want to stay with with the company as long as as I can. And uh, this is not a good mindset if you're running a startup, because because the the, 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 the from the founding perspective, uh, the, the, this is a startup model. So 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 you just quickly validate if it works. If not, it fails. If yes, you just sell it. Uh, so okay, you, you can sell it via IPO. You can you can sell it to, to some acquisition, but but still th there is yet another decision whether you stay there or not. You can stay as as a CEO, but you can stay as a, some advisory board. Uh, it, it it doesn't matter. It depends if you still have the heart to do it or or not. But from from the financial perspective, for me, it's. Uh, I don't know the answer. Um, we'll see where we are at the next round and the next round and, and what we would be the best solution uh, at, at the very moment. Right now, if I had the offer to buy out the, the whole company for a specific uh, valuation that is satisfactory, I, I would do it. Uh, I wouldn't hesitate. So, so uh, it, it has changed for me. I, I'm no longer treating the startup as, as something that is a long-term relationship. For me, this is something that uh, I'm putting a lot, a lot of heart into it. If it's if it's developing fine uh, and I can stay, I will do it. But I don't have to. I, I can sell it. If it fails, okay, it fails. Doesn't matter. Uh, it's it's a huge piece of experience for me. So, so actually, mm, it. it from my personal perspective, it doesn't matter what happens. Uh, from financial perspective, uh, whatever is best for the company and the shareholders. 
Yeah, as I was saying, I heard different stories. Also, sometimes it's based on what is the best for the company, because maybe you know will be very very hard, or you will need to. Uh, your word is limited, so if you need to get to the IPO, uh, you cannot just get there uh, with your little startup. You will also need to grow, acquiring other startups, so then to make it more attractive for the IPO. Or may so then they decide. So maybe if I still want to just deal with my own little word, this acquisition is a good idea. So sometimes people yeah. make this, uh, or I heard this that they people are uh, they start having some revenue. Why complicate the word? Like we can also stay small forever. And well, happy. yeah, but this this is probably not the best solutions for the other investors, not being the founders. Because they, they just want to exit. Uh, if this is a VC, they need to exit. So, so you need to somehow buy them out sooner or later. They will not stay forever with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. I, I don't know the point of view of who told me this slow growth, but it's, uh, it all depends also on the situation. Yeah, Maybe but, but the last question, mm -hmm. then I leave it to the people here. What uh, was the some something that really went wrong and maybe you want to share or something that you find very challenging uh, and you will say damn it if i knew that earlier i would have done it differently <laughs> yeah there the is there is thousands of things i would have done differently uh having having this experience but i think there are two major oh, this is this is actually the same there is one 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 major topic that maybe it's it's not something that I would have done differently, but it it's most challenging. I think when you are following the path, being a researcher, working at some scientific institutions, and want you want to trans make this transition into into a entrepreneurship and and uh, being a startup leader. Uh, the hardest thing is to change your mindset uh, from being. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to find the best best word for that. But if you're if you're a researcher, if you're still in this in this workflow of doing research, publishing, doing research, publishing, and so on, uh, you are very focused on doing the best R&D you can, the bleeding edge technologies. You, you, you need to be two steps ahead of, of your other competitors across across publishing, uh, because otherwise you will not publish. Yeah, it's not something new. It, it always needs to be a step forward in science, right? If you want to make a PhD, it needs to be a scientific step forward, right? And this is a very specific mindset. And when you transit to into, into business, you need to remember that the only thing that counts at the end of the day is your customers. Uh, if they are happy with the product and if they are paying for, for the product or, or, or service, doesn't matter. Uh, you don't need to always make a better and 100% best in the world solution from the R&D perspective. R&D is, is not the, uh, the reason why, why you're running a company, right? Uh, R&D is, is the process that needs to help, help you prepare a better product that is, that is be better for your customers. But, but you need to forget about the, this, this mindset that, that you always have to be from the technological and research point of view a number one. Uh, for the customers, quite often it doesn't matter. Uh, they, they just want a very, very simple solutions that that, that work. Uh, so maybe the same in other words. If you are in a scientific community, you, you for example, take a very, very well-defined and narrow data set and you show that your perfect algorithms work perfectly on this narrow data set and you, you, you have moved from 99.5 to 99.6 uh, accuracy and th this is perfect from the scientific point of view but if you are 
uh, at the business business uh, perspective, your customers doesn't give a shit about whether it's 99.5 or 99.6. They want something that works out there in the real uh, real world. Uh, so it does it has to work on all the data sets that are out there, not the very specific narrow scenario. So so this is this is the most challenging mindset mindset change. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Any of you has further last question or? I have questions. Can you hear Monica? Or... Yep. Okay. So uh, my first question would be regarding the IP. Because uh, I heard from startup colleagues from biotech uh, that when you do a spin off and you share the IP with the university, there can be a situation when investors are not super interested in collaborating with you because they are afraid of the IP being, being diluted. So the advice there was that you should have the whole IP inside your company and offer the university that you will pay them off when you will have the revenue. So should the startups be stubborn about having all the IP and then pay off or other strategies are okay? Like what are your experiences with the investors? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, so uh, every every investor will, will focus on that. Uh, it, it depends how elastic investors you will find and how important role this IP plays in, in, in your business. If this is a core technology for you and this is just to be or not to be of, of, your, of your company, then all the investors will push on that. And I agree that what you mentioned is probably one of the best solutions that you, that you put the IP inside the company. Uh, and you you pay it later for, for for the university. In our case, we we are still on the license agreement. We are paying some fees uh, coming from the license agreement, but the fees are counted as a prepayment for buying out the the IP. So if we pay enough of the fees, the IP is ours. But uh, remember the second hand side that the the, the, the um, scientific institution always wants to secure two things. Um, first thing that the, that the, 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 the scientific institution want to secure is having or not blocking the opportunity to further develop some scientific achievements on top of that on top of that solutions. So even in the case when you have the IP in your company, they would like to have some uh, loopback license that they can still use it. Um, and the second thing that they are very worried about, uh, you know, this, this kind of thinking, okay, this is something superb. I can get a Nobel Prize with that. But if I put it in the company and the company fails, I no longer have this IP and, and, and the company doesn't longer exist. So, so I cannot do it anything else with that. So they all always want to have some loopback scenario that if you fail, the IP comes back or, on some some basis uh, to 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 the scientific company, but yeah, the the solution you you said I think it, it's a very good one. It's one of the better ones, uh, and and uh, the investors will deeply look at it. Uh, and yeah, always they prefer to have it in the company. One of our investors were not was not very interested in that on the early stage, but the second one um, obliged us to change the license agreement so we have the exclusive rights to buy out the, the, the IP from the university, and we have it. So they actually continue to talk with you and ask if you are able to have the whole IP inside, because as I heard yeah. from the comments that when you apply or when you start talking with the investors and you say you share the IP, they like cut you off. They want, don't want to talk with you anymore. So it's so it's hard. It, it, it depends what you mean by share. Uh, so if you if by sharing you understand that you can use the IP, but someone else also can use it, uh, then it's it's a no no. Uh, so you you need to. We have an exclusive license, so so the university the university cannot use this IP anymore as long as we are a licensee. Uh, so 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 th th this is more secure. 
Okay, and now I don't know if this would be stupid, but can you have in the same time mm -hmm. the situation when you have the whole IP and in the same time there's this uh, this feature that the university have this loop back and when you pay the university off and something uh, at the farther development stage fails, then still university get back the IP or it it's it doesn't work that way. It cannot be in the same time. I don't know. I think it's case specific. It depends okay. on, 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 on on what specific add on, on on or further results you have in, in, in mind. But again from the investor's point of view i agree that there will push you very much into the direction that uh, for them the best solution is that your company is the only holder and user of of, of of that ip this is the best solution for for the investors no matter what okay thank you i have other questions if yeah go on Okay, okay, go. I mean, we, we told uh, Bartok we will take in one hour of time, so we let's keep it by 11. Okay, the uh, second question is about the first fundings, because uh, it seems that I also checked on your website that you had the grant, so I think it's a good idea to apply for a grant, at least at the beginning. And I was wondering, like, how long is it a good idea to apply for grants? I, I think that when you are building a prototype, it's nice, to, it's nice to have a, a grant from FNP or NCBR, but at which stage you should actually look for investors, not grants? Well, that, that's a hard one, because on one hand side, in Poland, you have, uh, and I do think it's a pathology, uh, you have a huge number of companies that exist just for running grants. Uh, so you are just taking grant after grant and 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 uh, yes, you are developing some kind of a product and you are providing it on the Polish market. And this is the end of your expectations. So uh, j j just to take another public money, another public money and, and just put some, some service or product into market. But, but I, I don't believe it's a, it's a way to go, especially if you want to be a startup. So if you be a startup, so first of all, I, I think you need to think globally from the very first day and you need to think growth, growth, growth from the very first day. So, so, so this is something that should drive you. Uh, and now you run into the question whether the mixed blessing of a grant uh, helps you to make step forward or not. Yeah. And on early for early stage companies, on one hand side, it's difficult to get a grant because you need to have some your own funding to put into into a grant. It, it doesn't always come that you have 100% funding if, if you're a, if you're an SME, um, and um, but this is very stabilizing. So if you know that you have a grant for two or three years, uh, you know that you have this money. Of course, if everything runs runs well smoothly, uh, and it's easy for you to maintain a specific level of basic operational operational level. So you don't have to worry whether you will have uh, the money for uh, for um, to pay to pay your personal and and to pay the, the money to, to, to your people next month. Uh, but at the same time, grants bring two additional burdens. So first of, first of all, uh, all the formalities, and second of all. Um, lack of um, agility. Uh, if, if you're a startup, you need to be very agile. So uh, this month you have this concept, by the next month you, you, you can just have a totally different concept of what you're doing with your product, with your technology. You, you need to have the possibility to make pivots. Uh, so, so, so this is not possible with a grant. And of course the grant introduces a lot of risks if you fail. Uh, especially if, if this is NCBR money, then it, it's very risky. So uh, in our case, we are trying to balance it. 
so we we did have a grant because our our first um, our first investors w was actually Alpha Bridge model, um, and and this is a combination of private money and and public grant, and this was this was okay for for the very early stage. Uh, it was fairly easy from the formalities point of view. It was good money to start with. Uh, and yeah, it, you just need to negotiate good, good conditions with, with this. But, but this model is fairly over this year. Uh, and now we have applied for a, for a grant in, in this new opportunity, the, the FANG, uh, FANG funds. Uh, and, um, but again, this is a very specific closed functionality that we want to develop. Uh, we will do it either way, whether we get this funding or not. And this is this is very closed, so it doesn't bring a lot of risk for the rest of the company. So if if the grant is unsuccessful, we we, we still sh should be able to to to, to go on. And unfortunately, the, the risk is there on the market because in in, in especially with the latest. Uh, Shipka uh, Szczeszka from from last year, uh, there were a lot of issues with with NCBR, and a lot of companies ran into a huge problems. So I know one one startup that that was performing a grant and they did something quite wrong from the formal point of view, and now the company is dead because because uh, they had to uh, they had to return like two million zloty in uh, to, to, to in, in grant funding and, and th this is just killing for them. Nobody will no investor will give them the money to, to return it to, to, to a public funding. So 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 th this is a huge risk. So I, I think it's better to balance it properly. But this is this is a strategic decision whether you are thinking on grants or not because you you can make a decision that no public funding is not for me I want to focus on on business and VC path only and and that there is no mixture but at the same time if you have a huge public grant uh, it makes you, it makes it easier to find investors also because they know that you have this additional stream of funding and that they are not the only one putting putting some some money into the company to develop it further yeah that's probably the best way to mix okay this has been uh, very insightful at least for me so if you don't have a further question, I would like to thank Bartosz. Then it was nice uh, talking to you and I wish you, we wish you a nice day and rest of the week. Yeah, you too. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.